Welcome to Beat Diabetes, and I promise this is the last time we're going to be talking about this book, Rethinking Diabetes, at least for a while. Uh, we'll move on to a new subject next Tuesday, but uh, there's just so much to it. And, and really, the, the fascinating thing about this book is it goes into a lot of the details of the struggle and the wrestling and the dispute and the disagreements between one group of researchers and another, one group of doctors and another, uh, one group of diabetologists and another, about what's the best thing you can do for a diabetic. And really, to be a, real, a little bit simplistic, I'll say this. There have been uh, essentially three major approaches to diabetes. The, the question obviously becomes, what do you do to kind of help yourself uh, if you find out you are diabetic. The number one and the pat uh, response has usually been watch your sugar and take your meds. That may include insulin or may not, but watch your sugar and take your meds. Again, we're, we're talking about type 2 diabetes here. And that has, that has been the standard advice. That is the standard of care. Watch your sugar. And I don't even like that phrase, watch your sugar. Don't watch it, eliminate it. Uh, but uh, they're scared to tell you to eliminate sugar altogether. So watch your sugar to cut it down a bit or quite a bit and take your meds and that's the best we can do. Another approach, not so much heard from the doctors, but from many nutritionists is go plant-based entirely. Give up on meat, meat's the problem. Saturated fat is the big bo boogeyman. And if you can just eliminate it, the saturated fat and the meat products and the dairy and the steaks and the pork chops and the sausage and the bacon and all the rest, uh, then you'll be in much better shape. So that has been another approach. And then there has been the approach made famous by Dr. Richard Bernstein, which is cut those carbohydrates down a lot. And when I first read him and uh, read about his plan of going to about 30 grams of carbs per day, I think it's like six in the morning, six grams of carbs with your morning meal, 12 for noon and 12 for your dinner meal, 30 total. I thought that's pretty radical. I wasn't doing anywhere close to that. Nowadays, with the keto diet and with the carnivore diet, there are a lot of people that do even less carbs than the 30 that Bernstein recommends. Anyway, there have been struggles back and forth, back and forth. And guess what? Your life and your health is on the line, depending on which way you go with this. And ultimately, you have to make that decision. Uh, you are responsible for your health ultimately. Yes, get a good doctor by all means and learn all you can and do your research. And <clears throat> do your research, read books. But ultimately, you're going to have to make the choice of which way you go. And sadly, the fourth approach, which is no approach at all, is, well, I'm just going to carry on as usual and I'll just hope I can hold out for a while. Uh, that's the very worst thing you can do. So anyway, Gary talks a lot about the struggle and the debates and the different research and the studies. And in some ways, these different studies remind me of playing poker. And one says, well, I'll see, you know, your study and I'll up you, I'll raise you two more studies. Oh yeah, well, I'll see your study and I'll raise you two more studies. And it kind of goes back and forth. Anyway, let's get into a couple of more uh, insights from Gary Tabbs and what he has learned. And uh, he is a researcher. He is not a medical doctor. But he talks about the factors that led many doctors and many people that uh, endocrinologists, diabetologists, as he calls them, to refuse to do the low-carb thing. So he gives two major reasons why in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, and even up till today, many just will reject a low-carb diet out of hand. So he says, here are two factors, or he says, two factors fed into the decision, collective decision, by the diabetologists to minif minimize the benefits uh, uh, to blood sugar that might come from dietary restriction. In other words, a lot of them didn't even want to hear about dietary restriction. You know, they don't want to talk to their patients about, well, here's the diet you need to need to embrace if you want to really beat diabetes or manage it or whatever term they wanted to use. One factor why they didn't even want to consider 
a change of diet. That's what we're talking about, a change of diet. One factor is, he says, they just didn't believe their diabetic patients would follow their dietary advice regardless of any benefit they might achieve from doing so. So he's saying, yeah, some of them knew low carb would work. They knew it would bring down glucose, but they didn't think anybody would follow it. And in a sense, they're almost right, but not totally right. I mean, you can go to YouTube channels like mine and Dr. Jason Fung's and Dr. Ken Berry's and, and Dr. Eric Westman's and different ones that preach a low carb diet. And you can find testimony after testimony into the thousands upon thousands of testimonies of people that did uh, a major benefit for themselves and their A1C and their fasting glucose and their diabetic complications. They, they essentially reversed diabetes and fixed almost everything that could be fixed by going low carb. But there were doctors then, as there are now, that say, well, I don't think anybody could really do it. If I did recommend low carb, if I did tell them to cut out the sugar and the starches and the carbs, I just don't think anybody would do it. People will do it. But here's the problem. If all you do is just say, well, here's your diet. You need to follow this. Cut out the starches. Cut out the sugars. Cut out the breakfast cereal. Cut out the pasta. Cut out the whole grains and all the other uh, carbs. If that's all you can say, then no, hardly anybody will be able to do it. You better be able to give them some testimonies and some evidence and some reason and some research as to why it will benefit you. You can't just say, do it. It'd, it'd be like me getting up on a soapbox in the middle of a big city intersection and shouting out, stop drinking so much. Stop Taking in your alcohol, well, I could shout all day long and it wouldn't do much good. But if you can give the reasons, a lot of people will listen. And that's one advantage I have over doctors. Yeah, I, I'm not a doctor, but I have a, an advantage that doctors don't have. I can talk to you two times a week, as many as 15, 20, 30 minutes each episode of Beat Diabetes. I can bring on all kinds of people, and I do, that have a testimony of beating diabetes, and I can give you far more input and insight and research and things to think about than the average doctor can when he brings you into his office, talks to you for about 10 minutes, does some tests, sends you on your way. They just can't do it, and I don't even blame the doctors for that. They don't have the time, and many of them, they can't afford to take five patients per day and spend all kinds of time with them. So a lot of them are taking 20, 25 patients per day, plus doing paperwork and all kinds of other things. And there's just no way they can spend much time with you. So if you just go in and they say, here's your diet, bye, see you later, you're not going to be convinced and you're not going to change. So when the doctors thought, as Gary Taubes mentions, well, if I tell them a certain dietary approach, they won't do it. Well, in a sense, they're right. They won't if that's all you do. But if you give them some good research and some testimonies and put some good books in their hands and advocate some good YouTube channels like, hint, hint, this one, and there are many others, uh, maybe they could follow that. And of course, we've got all the testimonies that indicate, and I mean thousands, that yeah, people will listen if they get enough information. And then he gives the second reason why doctors didn't really want to... Uh, bring about or encourage a change of diet. He says the second factor was the major advances in insulin and insulin delivery systems in the late 1970s. He says uh, diabetologists considered that the avant-garde of diabetes research was the, uh, the insulin's delivery, the fact that you can do, have insulin pumps now and it's much more convenient. And, uh, you know, we can, we can fine tune and you can fine tune how much uh, uh, insulin to give yourself. Taubes writes, diet was a purview of dietitians. Advances in drug and even surgical therapy was real medical science. It was all too easy for diabetologists to assume them as they do, assume then as they do now, that continued innovation in drug therapy and medical technology would render unnecessary any significant dietary sacrifices for diabetic patients. 
In other words, we're coming up with all these wonderful ways to give yourself insulin. We're coming up with all these wonderful medicines and uh, drugs that you can take. And we're doing all this research. Why should we try to encourage a low carb diet? Why should we try to tell you you've got to change your eating pattern? But as Dr. Jason Fung has famously declared, diabetes is a dietary disease and it requires a dietary recommendation and healing. You can't fix diabetes without fixing your diet. Yeah, you can take more insulin. Chances are that'll lead you to worse problems. You can take more meds. Not the answer. But when you fix it with diet, you can really fix it. And yeah, maybe you'll have to avoid potatoes the rest of your life. No big deal. Let me say that again. No big deal. I don't eat potatoes except for an occasional YouTube demonstration. And I don't suffer for it. And I don't cry around. And I don't sing songs like nobody knows the sorrows I've seen. There's a lot of great foods one can eat. But the doctors said, well, number one, they won't do it if we do recommend dietary change. And number two, we've got all this research and lots more coming and all these medical technologies and insulin pumps and everything else. Why do we need to tell them to stop eating potatoes and rice and sugar and starches and breakfast cereals? We don't have to tell them that. Just hold on to this new stuff that's coming out, these new ways of dealing with it. And they don't work. I mean, yeah, they're better than nothing, but they don't fix the ultimate problem. And Diabetics by the millions know that because they're not getting any better. They've been following their doctor's advice for decades, and they're about as bad as they ever were. Or maybe they're a little better, but not significantly. There's no getting around it. I don't care what new uh, medicine they come up with, what new form of insulin or insulin delivery system, what new CGM comes along, and I believe in CGMs. But ultimately, those CGMs should point you to this reality. I'm going to have to change the way I eat. And that means you cut out sugar altogether. You cut starches way, way down. You eat lots of salads and greens and meat if your religion allows you to. But basically, you eat low carb. Bernstein, what he figured out 60 some years ago, is still just as valid as it ever was. You got to change. And as Rocky said in that famous movie, I think it was Rocky Three. if I can change and you can change, maybe we can all change. Benedict and I do other things besides talk about overcoming diabetes. We have a Bible channel where we study the Bible together. This is probably not as somber a Bible study as you might be used to. We laugh and kid each other a bit, but we also go into the details of the scriptures and share insights from our many years of preaching and studying the Bible. Insights, I believe, will be helpful to you as you navigate your way through this difficult and dangerous world. Join us on Thursdays on the channel called By My Name, Dennis Pollock, and catch my short Bible Devos on Mondays on the same channel. Beating diabetes is great, but winning in the ultimate struggle of life is better still.